If you have a Bible, I want you to open to the book of Luke chapter 14. And while you're turning there, I'm going to share, you know, we're starting to this evening at, at sundown, we're starting a 21 day fast and the 21 day fast started this way. And I'm going to give you a little history about a month ago. I was really seeking the Lord about where word of life is going in the future and where we need to be in the coming months and what we need to be talking about in the coming months and just really seeking the Lord. And he said, Jeff, I want you to uh, take the month of September. And so, you know, with Pastor Jeff, here's something from God. I really, if I believe it's from God, you know, I'm going to do it and I'm not going to ask questions. I'm just going to say, yes, sir. Amen. But uh, he told me, he said, in the month of September, I want you to call it fill the house, fill the house. I said, God, what's that mean? He said, we're going to pray and we're going to believe that in all five of our services, God's going to fill the house. And uh, so the month of September, we're going to invite everybody we can invite to church. I got 5,000 invitation cards to Word of Life. You look around and go, my Lord, how many is each person going to have to give out? A lot. And so we're going to be talking about it the next couple of weeks. And we're fasting for 21 days. And we're, we're believing God that as we touch heaven, that earth is going to be changed. I'm believing for revival in Loudoun County. I'm believing for an influx into the kingdom of God. I'm believing. And the thing God asked me to believe for, he said, in the month of September, I want you to believe for the greatest number of souls to meet Jesus at Word of Life than any month in our history. I'm believing, God, that any month, any month, every time, that the month of September 2019 will see more souls saved than ever before. You don't do that without prayer and fasting. You don't see that happen without prayer and fasting. And so um, I want you to listen to something that kind of goes along with our theme for the next couple of weeks as we embark on this fast, because you're never going to change earth until you touch heaven. And so I want you to listen to this. If you know the song, sing along with it. But join us as we do this together. Are we there, guys? Boom. There it is. And there it is. And there it is.
Somebody, are you ready to see God do something significant in Loudoun County? I'm believing God. God's got something in urgency in my spirit that I can't get past. I, I'm believing God that in, in, the, in the month of September, I've asked all of our pastors, uh, French and Spanish and Urdu, we've asked all of our pastors, we're going to preach simple gospel messages in the month of September. We're going to make it plain for people to come to Jesus. The mission of Word of Life life is for people to encounter Christ, to engage in growth and to extend his kingdom. And so we're saying, God, we want people to meet Jesus in this house. And so for the next 21 days, we're fasting and praying and we're asking God to do what we can't even imagine in that in the following month, in the month of September, and then the month of October, we're going to do engaged classes to take those people that come and we're going to ask God to cause them to engage in growth and become part of the house. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you believe God's able? Amen. Do you believe God? Look at the empty seat next to you and say, be filled in Jesus name. Every seat in the house, every service, we're believing to be jam-packed. Amen. We're believing, God, the month of September is going to be the greatest month in the history and more lives impacted. You say, Pastor, how did that come to be? I was fasting and praying and seeking the Lord about how to do this and what to do. And so I want to bring your attention as we invite people into the house. Now, our ushers and greeters, you got to get ready because... Uh, ushers, our first impressions, ushers, greeters, connection center. We're buying t-shirts for all of you that say fill the house. You're going to have signs out in the parking lot welcoming people. We're going to get our youth involved wearing t-shirts. You're going to wear the same thing for four weeks straight on Sunday morning. Amen. We're going to welcome people into the house. We're going to, they're going to be looking good. We're going to have these young people out there smiling, greeting people in the parking lot. Say, come on into the house. And here's why Luke chapter 14, verse 15, start actually starting in verse 15. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied to this story, a man prepared a great feast and set out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I just bought a field and I must inspect it. And excuse me, please. In verse 19, another said, I've just bought five pair of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Verse 21, the servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported there's still room for more. By the third week of September, I'm going to be saying there ain't no more room for no more. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and another said, and he says this, he says, go get them. And he says, so his master said, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Look at your neighbor and say, he wants to fill the house. God wants his house full. And uh, as we come into this, the, I'm going to just share four brief things with you. And then we're going to eat some stuff out back after church. Amen. But as we share today, what is the purpose of this fast? I, I want you to get this because we want to fill the house, not just to fill the house to say we filled the house. But we're doing it, first of all, in obedience to the Lord who spoke to me and said, fill the house in September. And so we're not just doing this on our own thing that we want to be a bigger church and we want more people. Listen, I believe that America is at a crossroads right now. I believe we have never seen a demonic spirit that's been unleashed of murder, of, of abuse, of pain, of suffering. There has been an, a relentless attack on the United States of America. And as for word of life, the here's our purpose. We want to begin to rescue people because a Democrat and a Republican is not going to fix the issue of people 
walking into Walmart and murdering people. That murderous spirit is going to be dealt with in prayer and in fasting. It's only going to come when the America begins to pray again and begins to call on the God that we were founded upon. Listen, nobody, no legislation is going to fix what's wrong with America. What's wrong with America is going to change when God's people begin to pray and fast and say, God, I want to do what I can do. And that is I'm going to humble myself before the mighty hand of God. And we're going to say, God, we can't rescue America, but we can rescue somebody. I can rescue somebody in the month. It all starts when somebody gets rescued. I'm believing God for revival in America. And you might look at me like I'm crazy and say, we're only a handful of people in Northern Virginia. What can our 21 days of fasting and prayer do? I'm telling you, it only takes one or two. It only took 12 with Jesus. And we got more than 12 here today. I'm believing God that revival's going to start in this nation. And we're going to see a turnaround. We're going to touch heaven and change earth. We're, I'm tired of hearing about reports of people murdering and other people I'm tired of seeing it I'm tired of hearing it something's got to be done and so we're going to take our part and say you know what I don't, I'm not responsible for any other churches but as for word of life we're going to do everything we can to rescue every person we can rescue it's a story of an old man who comes out to the seaside and he sees thousands and thousands of starfish had had been had been sw uh, uh, swept up in the, in the middle of the night, had come ashore, and the tide had brought in thousands and thousands of starfish. As far as you could see, there were starfish as far as you could see. And the man's walking along, and he sees a little boy. And the little boy picks up a starfish, and he throws him out into the ocean. And he picks up another starfish, and he throws him out into the ocean. And the old man looked at the little boy, and he said, little boy... You can't save all these. You can't save all these starfish. The little boy looked at the old man. He said, but I can save this one. And he picked one up and he threw it. And as for word of life, I can't change America. I can't change it, but I can do something in my part. I can grab one or two souls and I can throw them back into the kingdom of God. I can do something to rescue this world from an evil spirit that has been released on our nation. And that's the purpose of fill the house. It's not just to get more people into a building. It's about people meeting Jesus. This generation needs hope. Why are they killing people? Why are they walking into places and, and opening their, 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 their guns up on people? Listen, it is because they don't have any hope in their life. But I met a man named Jesus who can give the hopeless hope. I met a man named Jesus who can cause a depressed individual that hates life and hates everybody's life to find love for the first time in their lives. And I am going to introduce some people to Jesus in the month of September. That's the purpose. E.M. Bounds said this. He said, don't talk to people about God until you first talk to God about people. Hello. I'm going to say it again so you get it. E.M. Bounds said, don't talk to people about God until you talk to God about people. And so that's when God spoke to me and said, if this is going to happen in September, then you would take the last 21 days of August and you talk to God about people. And so for the Monday to Friday, every day from noon to 1230, we're going to do a Facebook live broadcast from right here in the sanctuary. And if you can at work, you jump in and join in and you say, hey, we're going to pray together. We're going to do a Devo and then we're going to pray. God, fill the house. God, rescue. Bring revival to America. God, set the captive free, deliver the oppressed. We're going to call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're going to do for the next 21 days. We're starting tonight and tomorrow we'll be live at 12 noon and we'll go through some stuff together and then we will pray specifically. God, we want to see more people encounter Christ than ever before in our history. We want to see it come to pass. And so the purpose of the fast is simply this. We can't fix America, but we can fix a few people. And if I can rescue one during September, and if you can rescue one during September, and if we can help people to meet Jesus in September, we're going to do this at Luckett's. We're doing this in French. We're doing this in Spanish. We're doing this in South Asia. And we're believing God to do what man cannot do. We cannot get people to Jesus. We can put the, the, we can put the net out there, but whether they get in or not, 
God's got to draw people. And so we're going to ask God to do what we can't do. So why prayer and fasting, Pastor Jeff? And what about a Daniel fast? Now, we fast every year as a church. We believe in prayer and fasting. And I'm going to give you some of the precedents and why we believe in prayer and fasting at Word of Life. But uh, every January we do a fast and we, we do whatever you feel led to fast in, in January. And I have never, in 18 years I've pastored this church, I've never called this church to a Daniel fast. I don't like Daniel fast myself. I'm, I'm just like, you know, just forget food altogether. I don't need it. it just, so let's just, why a Daniel? And I, I, my only answer is, I feel like God spoke directly to me. And he said, call your people to a Daniel fast. And I just said, yes, sir. <laughs> And so we're going to get into some of the whys and that kind of thing. But the bottom line is I'm trying to be obedient to God. And I feel like he's called us to do a Daniel fast together for the next 21 days. And so I want you to see the precedence of why is it that people fast? And what, what about fasting in the Bible? What's this all about? In Acts chapter 13, verse 12, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. I want you to see it says, while the apostles, while the early church was, was together worshiping and fasting. Look at your neighbor say fasting. They heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. I can promise you this. The next 21 days, if you'll commit to this fast and say, I'm going to eat fruits, vegetables, I'm going to drink water, and uh, I'm going to come off of sugar and all them caffeines and all that uh, stuff that man, man manipulated kind of foods, and I'm not going to eat no meat, and I'm going to, I'm going to eat fruits and veggies for 21 days, I can promise you this. Them first few days are, you're going to want cake like you never wanted cake in your life. You're going to want some pie. You're going to want some French fries. You're going to want, you're going to want some, you're going to want something else besides doing this. But what's the benefits to fasting? What does it do? I'm going to guarantee you this by day 21. I guarantee you, you're going to be more spiritually alert to the voice of God than you were on day number one. I promise you, your spiritual ears will open up when you fast. When you lay aside something for the purpose of focusing on the Lord and what he wants for your life, you will begin to hear the voice of God. You will begin to have dreams and visions. You will, your spirit man will be opened up during this fast. And so ask God and say, God, I'm going to do this thing. So you see them worshiping and fasting and then the Holy Spirit speaks. You need direction in your life, fast and pray and then he'll speak. Esther chapter 4 verse 16. Esther is going to go before the king and she's going to ask the king to, uh, to stop and order that all the Jews be killed. And she says this, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Amen. Esther says, hey, gather all the Jews in Susa and let's fast for three days and then I'm going to approach the king. And I might die, but I'm going to approach the king. I need to gather a fast. I need people to fast and to pray. And so they set aside, they fast and they pray. And what happens? She goes before the king and the king grants her wish. And every Jew is saved because she fasted and prayed and called the people to fast. So what does fasting do? Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, Moses was there with the Lord on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights without eating food or drinking water. And he received the Ten Commandments. Wow. You say, Pastor, what am I going to receive? You're going to receive a word from God. And when you begin to fast and you begin to pray. So Moses, 40 days on the mountain, no food, no water. Jesus, 40 days, goes out into the wilderness, spends 40 days of fasting and prayer. This is a thing that we see, a precedence in Scripture. That when we need to see God do something, we humble ourselves and we fast. And we call on the one Who's able to do what we can't do. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says this. Even now declares the Lord. Return to me with all your heart. With fasting and weeping and mourning. He says return to me with all your heart. With fasting, weeping, and mourning. When you've strayed away, what do you got to do? You come back to God humbly broken. And you say, God, would you please restore me? God, would you? I'm going to humble myself and fast and pray and call on the name of the Lord. So Joel gives a prescription for when a nation is going away, they got to come back with fasting and mourning and saying, God, we need you in our nation again. 
Nehemiah chapter 1, verse number 4. Nehemiah sees what's going on in Jerusalem. And verse, chapter 1, verse number 4 says, When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah got word that the city of Jerusalem, its, its gates were, were burned down and its walls were crumbled down. And Nehemiah says, you know what? I got to do something. I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I've been deported from that place and I, I hear well, there's something going on there. So he says, I need to do something. And so what I can do is I can proclaim a fast. And so he mourns and fasts and prayed before the God of heaven. He saw something and he wept. He cried during this fast. What I'm going to ask of you, I'm going to ask you to say, God, give me a heart. That feels what you feel. God, let me experience what you experience. God, let me hurt with what hurts you. When's the last time you wept over the state of somebody else? When's the last time you wept and cried and said, God, would you please move in my neighborhood, in my city, in my region? When's the last time? See, Nehemiah sees that the walls are broken down and he weeps and cries and says, God, something's got to happen. Your city is about to be destroyed. Your city is in ruins. And when I look across America today, I see a nation in ruins, in need of a move of God, in need of something supernatural that man can't start it and man can't stop. It, but we can align ourselves with God. And when we align ourselves with God, God will begin a supernatural move when we're aligned with him and we're hearing his voice and we're weeping for souls and saying, God, we want to see you do something in the month of September that becomes contagious around this world. We want to see God do something supernatural. I'm not willing to just let the world go. My heart is broken for people who are broken and Nehemiah sees it so what does he do he fasts and he prays before the God of heaven Ezra very similar Ezra chapter 8 verse 21 to 23 I proclaim the fast so that we might humble ourselves before God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children and all our possessions as they're going back toward the temple Ezra proclaims a fast and he says here's why to humble ourselves before God What is a a fast really? Now you get into a biblical Old Testament fast. I'm going to have some fun with you for a minute. But an Old Testament biblical fast was a time of mourning. It was a time of uh, things are not right and we need to get them right. And so the Old Testament guys, we're going to see it in Daniel in a minute when we go there. But but, um, as you look at this, they would put on burlap. Now that's about as uncomfortable as you can get. (laughs) And so they would fast, they'd put on burlap, they'd put ashes on their head and ashes all over them. And they'd sit in ashes and they would weep and they would cry and they would mourn. And people would be like, what is wrong with that prophet over there? That guy is crazy. It was an outward expression that said, God, we will... We will suffer ourselves on behalf of a nation. We will humble ourselves and say, God, we are a nobody. Like we, we were all about being confident and bold in Jesus and all of those wonderful things. But there comes a time when you realize this fight is bigger than you. We don't wrestle against fl- flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this present age and, and forceful things in high places. We're wrestling against a battle that is not going to be beat in the flesh. It's going to be beat when we humble ourselves before God and say, God, we can't do it. We need intervention from you. We need you to move among our young people. We need you to rescue those who are perishing. We need you to do something. And so a biblical fast is a time of humbling ourselves and saying, I don't have the answer. I can't fix America. I can't fix Loudoun County. But I know a God who can do the impossible. I know a God who can turn it around in a night. I know a God who can change things. He can start a revival in a moment. He can just begin to cause an influx of souls in a moment's time. That when we look at what's our precedence. This is what they did in the Old Testament. When the nation would stray away, they would call a fast and prayer. And weep and mourn and moan and groan and say, God, we're sorry. We blew it. We strayed away from you. And we humble ourselves. 
And so we see the purpose and the precedence, but I also want you to see the pattern. And the pattern that we're going to use as a church is found in the book of Daniel. And so I want you to flip to Daniel with me. I'm really excited because it, it probably this week we're going to, we're, we're launching a brand new church app and church is going to be so much fun. Amen. I was, I, I, I tried, I did a trial this week. I was so excited. I almost launched it today and I said, no, it's not fully done yet. And when it's fully done, we're going to launch it. But it's beautiful because you're, you're literally on your phone. You're going to have an app. And when I preach a sermon and words come up here like this on a the screen, they're going to be on your phone. And there's going to be fill in the blanks and you can on your phone fill in the blanks. Amen. And I'm not going to rebuke you for being on your phone during service. Everybody's going to be on their phone during service. And there's going to be a place for you to take notes right on that church app on the thing. And then you can email it to yourself. You can save it on your phone and you can have all the notes. It's going to be a beautiful thing. I'm so excited. I'm excited. What God's doing some really neat stuff at Word of Life. And so as we get ready for this, here's what I want you to get note of today. Before we have it on our phones, I want you to get note of this. Daniel chapter 1. I see a pattern in Daniel's life. A pattern of fasting and prayer that was part of his life. And it starts out Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Belshazzar, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. As you look at these guys, you see that they were set apart. They're in Babylonian captivity. They've been taken out of their nation, deported to another nation. They are being kind of raised up. People in, in that nation have realized these guys are special. They're smart, they're educated, they're good looking. And so we want to invest into their lives. We want to train them to be uh, true Babylonians. We want to train them in Babylonian literature. And we believe there's something special about these guys. So they determine you're going to eat the king's food and we're going to train you in the palace. And it's going to be wonderful for you. The Bible says in chapter 1 verse 8, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. But God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid my, of my Lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed with to, David, to Daniel's suggestion, and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the king's, the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. Somebody say, wow. Now, this wasn't necessarily a fast, a biblical fast, where he's humbling himself before God and, and entreating God on behalf of something. But this is just his personal walk with God, where he had made a declaration, hey, I'm not going to eat things and drink things that God doesn't want me to eat and drink. And so he comes to the king and says, King, please give us permission not to eat like you do. Just give us vegetables and water and we'll be good. In the Hebrew, this word for vegetables, it literally means something that comes from a seed. And so this could be a tree, which would be a fruit. This could be a plant, which would be a vegetable. So it's fruits and vegetables. So the, the real word there is not necessarily vegetable in the Hebrew. It is something that comes from a seed. So if it grows in the ground... He said, I'll eat it, <laughs> but I don't want you adding a whole bunch of stuff and preservatives and a bunch of refined sugars and a lot of junk that, uh, that's been changed. And, and I don't want you, I don't want your wine. Uh, I, I know it grows on a, on a vine, but I don't want your wine because that's not what, where we should be in our, in our person. So the pattern here, I see a physical test. He says, test us for 10 days. Can I tell you, if you'll jump on this with us, that in 21 days from today, you're going to feel fantastic. Amen. You're going to have all that sugars and starches and all that junk and the preservative. You're going to have it all out of your body. You're going to come in here going, Pastor, I feel so good. Amen. 
Because all that stuff, you ain't, all that bread, all that stuff that's just been sitting in your body so long, it's all going to be gone and you're going to feel fantastic physically. So Daniel fast, I've never personally done one because I like just going without food. I like to just throw, just forget it. I'm not touching it. But the Daniel fast is saying, hey, I'm going to give up the pleasant side of food. Amen. I'm going to give up my cakes and my sugar and my pies and my all that. Junk. I'm going to, I'm going to lay it aside for spiritual purposes. So I see a physical test. And if you make it through the first few days, now I guarantee you this as, as we embark on this. If you're a heavy coffee drinker, I already got people going, Pastor, coffee's a bean. It grows on a plant. Amen. But that cream and that sugar is not. <laughs> and unless you can go back and get, get if, you, if you can get some raw sugar cane, I'll let you put that in there. Amen. But uh, once it's been processed, it becomes a mess for your body. Amen. And so our bodies are processing all this stuff and causing us all kinds of problems. And so this is going to be a physical thing and you're going to feel really good. But them first few days, your body is not going to like it. I promise you. Your body is going to struggle and fight. But about day number four, you're going to go, wow, I feel energy. I feel alert. I feel alive. I feel good. And by the end of this thing, you're going to be going, I don't know if I want that stuff. Amen. I hope because... I need that to happen, amen, in my life. I want you to flip over to Daniel chapter 9 as we continue looking at Daniel's life of fasting. And his life, his pattern that he gave to us in his personal life. And so, Daniel chapter 9, here's what happens. Verse number 1, it says, The first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians, during the first year of his reign, I, Daniel... Learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet. Somebody say the word. So here you got Daniel who's reading a contemporary of his, which is now in our Bible called Jeremiah. He's reading the prophet Jeremiah. He's reading the prophetic word of God. He's reading the word of the Lord and the Lord speaks to him and he says this. He says, I learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah that Jerusalem would lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him through prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. Wow. And I want you to listen to what Daniel prays because he read the Bible. And when he read the Bible, he got so convicted. He went to fasting and prayer and, and sprinkling ashes on himself just from reading the prophetic word of God. When's the last time the Bible caused you to do something like that? Somebody say, ouch. When you read the word of God and it penetrates your soul, which it did for Daniel here. And he prays to the God of heaven and he confessed, oh Lord. You are a great and awesome God. You're always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who you love and obey your commands, who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far wherever you've driven us because of our disloyalty to you. And so Daniel begins to cry out to God based on the word of Jeremiah, the prophet that he read that there would be 70 years of desolation. He says, hey, we've got to call out to God and humble ourselves and return to him. But I want you to get this because nowhere in your Bible do we show Daniel ever being a sinful person. Daniel's one of the people in the Bible that's very revered, very honored for being a man of integrity and character and a man of prayer and a man who literally the history of the world was revealed to him in Daniel chapter 11 and 12. As you go through it, this guy had revelation upon revelation and we never see him in sin yet. He's the one saying we have sinned. 
We have failed you. We have messed up as a nation. And so this is what I call intercession. Intercession is when you're standing before God and you're taking responsibility, not for your own stuff, but for the nation around you or the city around you. And you begin to say, God, I'm interceding and saying, God, forgive us. We have gone away from you. We have messed up. We have done wrong. We have allowed racism and bigotry. We have allowed things into our lives. We have murdered babies. We have done all of these things. We have done wrong as a nation. God forgive us. Did I personally kill any babies? Did I personally do anything wrong? Am I personally a bigot? Am I personally? No, it's not my. But as a people, intercession means I'm representing some people before God. And I use the word we. Amen. We humble ourselves and go, we have messed up. Because we are in this together. If the body of Christ is messed up today, we're in it together. Look at your neighbor and say, we're in it together. We got here together. We're going to get out of this together. We're meant as a body to do things together. It's togetherness that gets it to happen. And so I want you to see when you cry out to God, you cry out, we have done wrong. Even though you personally, your pride might go, hey, you haven't done anything wrong. You don't have to confess that. Hey, we as a people have done wrong. Now flip over to Daniel chapter 10 as we wrap this up. Daniel chapter 10. Here's another situation where Daniel goes into prayer and fasting. This time he's about to receive a revelation that is uh, literally life altering, world altering. It's. Uh, mind-blowing, mind-boggling kind of revelation he gets. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of King, in the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. You get your neighbor say 21 days. All that time, I had eaten no rich food. Ouch. No meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until the three weeks had passed. Now, uh, I'm not going to ask you to, to, um, to fast fragrant lotions. Because when you start eating right and your body is releasing toxins, your body going to smell. Amen. Your breath's going to smell. Your body going to smell. It, it's not going to be good. I am not asking you to fast fragrant lotions, okay? You, I don't mind you using fragrant lotions. Use lots of them. Cover up the fact that you're fasting. I'm not asking you to go there. Daniel felt he needed to go there. But I'm not calling you to, to put away your perfume. Matter of fact, you might want to use a little more. And I am not doing a fast of gum. Gum can help your breath without. <laughs> it, can, it can help your bad breath. That's happening when all them toxins are coming out. Amen. And so. Uh, we, we are here to humble ourselves before God. Not to offend the people around us. Who got to smell us. Amen. <laughs> Keep it real Pastor Jeff. Glory to Jesus. So he said. For three weeks and then literally I want you to see this April 23rd as I was standing on the bank of the Tigris River. I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and his feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. That sounds very li like the book of Revelation. Revelation describing Jesus Christ. This guy at, at the end of his 21 day fast. He's having visions of Jesus. Come on. He's having visions and revelations about things to come. And if you read the following chapters of Daniel 10, 11 and 12. You're going to see the world history is laid out for him. Why? Because he was a man of fasting and prayer. Who sought the face of God. And at the end of his fast. God opens the heavens and speaks. Amen. We close out today by talking about the power of unity and fasting together. Matthew 18, 19 says, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my father in heaven will do it for you. Psalm 133 verse 3 speaks of unity and tells us that when there's unity there, God commands his 
blessing. We're going to ask God to bless this house in the coming 21 days. We're going to unify together and we're going to fast together and we're going to get on Facebook Live together and we're going to respond to emails and we're going to begin fasting and praying together for God to do something supernatural in the month of September that will cause us to stand back and say, God, only you could have done this. Only you could have saved this many souls. Only you could have brought this many people into the kingdom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to reach up in 21 days and we're going to touch heaven. Heaven. We're going to call on the name of the Lord. We're going to humble ourselves before God and say, God, our slick programs and our slick plans and our slick advertising, we're going to do it all. We're going to do everything we can. But God, unless you build the house, we labor in vain. Unless you come down and rescue some souls, we're just going through the motion. We're going to touch heaven in 21 days and then we're going to change the earth around us. We're going to begin to see people encounter Jesus Christ. Christ in a real way. Amen. And I realize people feel like it's impossible. It doesn't happen in Northern Virginia. I'm so tired of hearing that negative junk. I'm ready to tell them people, listen, it can happen here and it's going to happen here. All God needs is a body joined together, agreeing together for a harvest of souls. And it will come to pass when God's people look up to him and get our eyes focused on him. We will see him reveal his glory. It's coming. It's coming. We're going to see something happen in our midst and it's going to take both parts. It's going to take touching heaven, but it's going to take a lot of invite cards touching earth and changing earth. It's going to take all of us out inviting our friends. Man, you got to come to church this Sunday. My pastor's got a word about Jesus. You got to hear it. You need to be there. I got I got invitation cards with all five of our services. So that if you happen to be in a restaurant and you see somebody speaking French, you just go, hey, our church has a French service. Amen. If they're speaking Spanish somewhere, you just hand them a Spanish. You say, hey, our church has a Spanish service. You need to come. You hear them speaking uh, Hindi or, or, or Urdu or something. You just hand and say, hey, South Asia, we have a special service just for South Asian people. My neighborhood in Luckett's, I'm looking for God to fill the house in Luckett's. I'm personally going. And so the, four, the last Saturday of August and then the first three Saturdays of September, we're going to go out on Saturdays and invite people into the house. We're going to go into highways and, and hedges and say, uh, come in, compel them to come in. And we'll tell them anything it takes to get them in the building. Glory to Jesus. No, we won't lie to people. But we're going to get them in the building. We're going to beg people. If they're going to go to hell, it's going to be over our invitation and our prayers and our intercessions. It's going to, we want to make it hard to go to hell from Loudoun County. That's my dream. I want if somebody wants to go to hell from this region, I want them to go over my tears and over my prayers and over my begging and over my saying, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up. I want you to stand with me as we wrap this message up about touching heaven and changing earth. God wants to do something significant in our midst. God wants people to encounter Christ. And so what we're doing is we're that that month of September. We're saying, God, four Sundays, we want to people to encounter Jesus right here in this sanctuary. We want people to meet Jesus right here. That fifth Sunday is going to be a family Sunday. That's where we baptize people. Will you agree with me that we want to baptize some people on the last Sunday of September in this place. Amen. Amen. Some brand new converts. Some brand new people to Jesus. Some, we're going to believe God for it together. We're going to come in unity and seek the face of God. We're going to baptize and we're going to have a celebration on family Sunday. And then the first Sunday of October we're going to start our engage classes. And say hey we want to see you get engaged in the body of Christ. Then in November, we go into Ghana and we're going to extend the kingdom more and more around the world. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. That's what we live for. Will you just start this season of prayer and fasting with me by helping us to touch heaven right now? Would you just begin to lift up your voice with me? 
Father, as we embark on this journey together, God, as we embark together as a congregation, as we have shared the vision, God, that you put into my heart along. Come on, I want everybody praying right now. Lift up your voice to the Lord your God. Father, we humble ourselves before you. Before the fast even begins, we declare today, God, and we decree, we know that we can't do this. We don't have what it takes, but you have what it takes. You have put your spirit inside of us to be a witness to this world and father right now we come against every power and principality that's been holding the harvest back and we say today we're going to press in we're going to touch heaven over the next 21 days we're going to call out to the lord god almighty we're going to ask him to do signs and wonders we're going to ask him for miracles we're going to ask him to do what is physically impossible for us we're going to call on the name of the lord like we've never called on him before we humble ourselves and say God unless you build the house we're just laboring in vain unless you move by your spirit we can't do anything unless you draw them God we can't manipulate them we can't coax them we need your spirit to be active in this house we need your spirit oh God to resurrect to breathe on dead bones that Moki shared about to breathe life into dead bones in Ashburn in Sterling in Herndon in Chantilly, in South Riding, in Aldi, in Gainesville. We call dead bones back to life. In Leesburg, in Hamilton, in Percival, in Luckett's. We call dead bones back to life in the name of Jesus. Come, wind of God, and breathe upon dead bones again. Breathe, God, upon your people. Oh, mighty King, we call upon the name above every name and say at your name, Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess. Oh, Father, your people are unified together, calling upon you. And we're expecting something supernatural in the month of September. We're expecting breakthroughs. We're expecting alcoholics to be set free. We're expecting drug addicts to be delivered. We're expecting those addicted to pain medications to be set free. We're believing God that things will will begin to transpire in our midst that we can't explain except to say we humbled ourselves before God Almighty and God did the work. Woo, Jesus. God, our fight is not against flesh and blood and it's not about Democrats or Republicans. We're in a fight for the soul of America and today we begin a war. Today we begin a fight. We are not willing to see them go to hell. We're not willing to see them go in the wrong direction. We're going to cry out to the Lord our God. Woo, Jesus. Rescue marriages, God. Rescue lives, rescue those who are suicidal. No more suicide in our schools. No more suicide in our region. No more murder. No more jealousy, greed, envy, backbiting. Let anger be dealt with, Father. We call on you for a supernatural move of God. God will never cease to give you the honor and the praise when it's done. We will worship you until there's nothing left in us to worship you. We will worship you until we've worshipped you. And God, we pass out worshiping you. God, we will give you all of the honor, the praise, and the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, get ready. God's about to do something in our midst. Look at somebody else and say, go buy some food and support our youth. Amen. (laughs) The fast starts at sundown tonight, so you better eat while you can.